All right, hello. My name is Karen Lauritsen. I am with the Open Textbook Network. Welcome to our very first Pub 101. This is called Meeting Zero or Orientation. I am joined here by Mark Sheaves, who has introduced himself in the chat. He is our community manager and he will be monitoring the chat. So please post any questions that you have there. Uh, Mark is waving uh, from his cabin-like environment. Um, please post your questions there and he will answer what he can and we will um, look at those together periodically. So um, I see some of you have turned on your cameras. You're absolutely like welcome to do that. Um, it is a larger group. Sometimes that can impact bandwidth, um, but uh, it is preferred to, to see you when possible and definitely when we head into smaller breakout groups. So I'm really excited to welcome you to Pub 101. We've had a great response. There are more than 150 people who are interested. Um, of course, not everyone can make a synchronous meeting, so there will be video recordings to share. Um, and all of you are representing institutions across the country in different roles. And um, this is the first time that we've offered Pub 101 in this way, so I really look forward to your input to inform future iterations. So to review the plan for today, um, I've introduced myself. Shortly you will have the opportunity to introduce yourselves to a small sample size. Um, we will take a look at our orientation plan. I'll introduce a shared document where we can have continued conversation and ask questions. And I'll also touch on how Pub 101 connects to the publishing cooperative in the OTN. Our goals for Pub 101 are really to start building community support for open textbook publishing and helping you determine your pathway forward for open textbook publishing, if that's what you decide you want to do. You may also just want to learn more about this, um, this whole world, and that's totally fine too. This is a very informal group and there are no grades, there are no uh, hardcore assignments, and um, everybody is welcome. The other thing we're going to touch on today are the fundamentals, um, what we're talking about when we talk about open textbooks, that is that they're free with permissions. This is the content that you'll be reading about um, in your homework unit one between now and our next meeting. The other thing we're briefly going to touch on today is how something is a textbook and not a monograph. What makes it special um, in a textbook? So that's our plan. This is the only meeting when it will be mostly me talking. All of the other meetings will be featuring your colleagues from across the country who have hands-on experience supporting authors in open textbook writing and publishing. So, um, so stay tuned for that. Uh, this is not representative of future meetings. So briefly, I know that many people forwarded um, this invitation to colleagues at their institution, and uh, you may not be firsthand familiar with the Open Textbook Network, so I'm just very briefly going to introduce you to our community. We are uh, higher ed professionals who are working together to advance open education. And one of our core beliefs is that higher education can own the production and dissemination of academic content to their students. And so because we believe that, we want to build capacity with you, support one another, and provide access to services. So Pub 101 is really an introduction to open textbook publishing, an overview of what's involved. We're definitely not going to cover it all um, in our few weeks together. So as I mentioned, we're focused on open textbooks, which are defined as free with permissions. That means, of course, free to students. They're able to get one complete portable copy at no price with permissions for authors or students and others to change it um, without seeking permission other than the license assigned to it. It is, of course, usually a Creative Commons license. We're also focused on textbooks in terms of pedagogical structure. Textbooks are different from a monograph. It's not a long block of text. Um, it's not necessarily making an argument. It's really introducing ideas and concepts, which usually means that there's an introduction, there might be a summary at the end of the chapter, there might be reflective questions, for example. I'm sure you can all imagine some of the different elements that make up an open textbook. 
And that's something that you'll continue to learn about in unit one. So you may have heard people in the OTN uh, say that it's not necessarily that we think textbooks are the end all be all in terms of uh, pedagogical instruments, but it is a really handy way to sort of build a parameter and have a concrete object to work with in promoting open education. Faculty are familiar with textbooks. They have assigned them for their course typically. They know that adoption process. And so it's really um, just a tool a strategy, a methodology, if you will, for advancing open education by focusing on, on a textbook. But there's lots of things that you can learn in Pub 101 that can apply to other OER. Um, a lot of this process is project management, which we'll talk about. And so um, I hope no matter what OER you're um, developing yourselves or supporting the development of, that there will be something uh, useful for you. So I'm going to launch a quick poll here. And the question is, why did you decide to join Pub 101? If you could please um, let us know in the poll, that would be great. I will give you guys a few seconds. We'll see how this works. Do you guys see a poll? Okay, it's happening. It's like watching the stock market. The numbers are coming in, it's exciting. I see uh, percentages growing and dropping. For me, the poll is in a small pop-out box. Is that how other people are seeing the poll? I see, I see um, responses coming in. Yes, Adrian says yes. <laughs> Joe asks if the stock market is plummeting. Joe, that's too close to home right now. Polls might look different if you're calling in from a mobile, Elle says. That's really helpful. Thank you, Elle. All right, we've had about a minute and um, I'm going to end the poll. I wonder if when I end the poll, I will be able to see the results. Before I end the poll, I'm gonna tell you what the results are. Um, as I mentioned, this is a large group and in previous cohorts, um, we've had much smaller groups. So bear with me as I learn some of these uh, fancier Zoom techniques. So, why did you decide to join Pub 101? 10% of you want to write an open textbook. 80% of you, the overwhelming majority, want to support open textbook authors. 15% are responsible for OER publishing. 33% may decide to launch an OER publishing program. 21% are just here because they're interested and they want to learn. And 2% say there's another reason that you did not put in this poll that perhaps I reveal in the chat. So I've ended the poll. I'm sharing results visually. Again, it's a little pop out window for me. I appreciate the support you guys are offering one another in the chat as well. So um, I've also seen that some of you are introducing yourselves to one another in the chat, which um, is great if you guys want to say who you are and why you're here. We are also going to move on to an introduction to activity in smaller groups. Um, that's because I'm not the expert here in Pub 101. My role really is as facilitator, bringing you together with your colleagues who have experience in publishing and capitalizing on the expertise that they have developed, sometimes through trial and error, sometimes through for more formal learning. Um, and they really are excited about supporting you and building a community together with you. So although we cannot go around the room, so to speak, and meet everyone, I think that would be a little bit uh, much with 69 people here currently. We can uh, do a sample size, if you will and get to know just kind of uh, who's here more anecdotally in a smaller group. And so I'm going to do that in a breakout room. So how that works is I'm gonna press a button and you guys are going to be split into separate breakout rooms randomly. You will find yourselves there. And when you get there, I suggest turning on your camera and turning on your microphone and simply getting to know one another, introducing yourselves briefly. For example, if I were in a breakout group, I'd say, hey, my name's Karen Lawrenson. I'm the director of publishing at the Open Textbook Network. 
And I'm in Pub 101 because I want to bring people together so they can support one another in open textbook publishing across institutions. Short and sweet, I'm going to give 10 minutes. Um, when it's time to regroup, you will get a 60 second warning telling you, hey, this group is going to end in 60 seconds. So um, if you haven't heard from everyone yet, by that time, please make sure that um, you give somebody space to introduce themselves. So any questions, Mark, so far that we need to answer before going into breakout rooms or any questions about how to introduce yourselves to one another? There's nothing, nothing in the chat. Nothing in the chat. Nothing. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's a little bit odd not to see everybody's face. I miss, I miss seeing you guys. I'm not going to lie. Oh, will the breakout rooms be recorded for absent colleagues? Sadly, they will not. Um, but on the upshot, uh, some of you may be liberated by not being recorded. So the, um, the breakout rooms are not recorded. Any other questions before we give this a shot? All right. See you guys in about 10 minutes. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Let's try leaving cameras on if you're comfortable with that, because it's so much friendlier, so much nicer, at least for me, selfishly. Um, so I learned that polls and breakout rooms may not work when folks are in the browser client. So I will have to check out exactly what that means, but um, that was a helpful note that I received in the chat. So if that was a dud for you, I apologize. Um, but I think for most of you, you were able to meet a sample size. Maybe uh, you saw some folks that you already know, uh, met some new people, but um, I hope it gave you a sense of kind of who's here and um, what you guys are gonna be doing. So our orientation plan. Now I'm going to go into kind of the big picture overview about what to expect over the next couple weeks. You'll notice I'm trying to avoid using the word syllabus. Um, that's really because I don't think of this as a class. There are of course no grades or assignments, but also we don't have to say goodbye when it's over. This can just be the beginning. It's really more of an informal orientation. Um, come when you can. Uh, there will be recordings. I should be recording now. Yes, still recording. There will be recordings um, that you can watch if you miss a meeting. If you happen to be late or can't make it one week, that's okay. You don't have to let me know, although you can let me know as well. Um, and then one thing to be aware is if you do come at a time when we're all in breakout rooms, it might be a little bit odd, but I tried to um, assign you all as you, as you came in. So our not syllabus, our master document or our schedule um, that Mark has put in the chat, I think all of you have had a chance to look at this. I think you all might be in there right now, according to um, what I see in my little right hand corner of Google. So you guys are already familiar with the goals. You're familiar with the introduction. I will tell you broadly with this document, I kind of want, I want it to be your one-stop shop when you're thinking about Pub 101 and you're like, where are those videos? Or what was that assignment? Or what did she say about that? It's either going to be in here or it's going to be linked from here. That's really my goal. Um, so I hope that's helpful to you that you're not kind of jumping all over into different documents. Um, you can see the learning objectives there. I've already started talking about differences between textbooks and monographs. You're gonna learn a lot about that in unit one. Um, identifying steps of the publishing process, including common roles and responsibilities in pre-production and production. A lot of these um, roles and processes are flexible. So it'll be up to you to decide what you think is important and what you may want to include if you decide to be supporting publishing at your institution. Um, we're also going to jump into project management methods for communicating with authors, managing expectations, and timely production cycles. For those of you who want to be writing a textbook yourselves, um, I think this will still be useful. You'll get some tools for um, how to manage yourself and other people you'll be working with. And then you can start to create a plan if you want for your publishing program and think about next steps. So after Pub 101, I will invite you to additional trainings. If you want to learn the scribe methodology for publishing open textbooks, 
if you want to come to a few sessions about Pressbooks, um, that will be available to um, eligible members. Further down in the NOT syllabus, uh, you can see the list of facilitators. Uh, these are the many people we will welcome over the next few weeks. I also expect that many of you will have experience and expertise in some of the topics that we explore. So please, you know, chime in in the chat, um, share your knowledge with others that is encouraged and welcomed. You can see the schedule there. You can see Zoom. Under Zoom, I've linked to our YouTube channel that um, will shortly have this video in it. So you can always find videos there. And then how much time should you set aside? This, of course, is really up to you. But I expect that reviewing a unit a week will take about an hour. And um, there's a couple of homework assignments early on. I don't think those will take too long. Again, totally optional. Does anyone have questions about our not syllabus? Or to use a more positive term, our orientation plan, our schedule? This is pretty straightforward for you guys. Great, okay. I will take that as please continue talking. Um, so you can see from the orientation plan that we're gonna cover units one through five of the Open Textbook Publishing curriculum. There are new quizzes at the end of each unit. Uh, no data is recorded. Um, those again are not graded, so give them a go. Um, I'm excited about them because they're a new improvement to the curriculum. Um, this curriculum is really a product of the first two publishing cooperative cohorts that we've had so far, um, and our partnership with Scribe, who is a publishing services provider. So they really helped us build out, you know, what kind of roles are typical in publishing, some things to think about. Um, and as I mentioned, this is a very different format, the Pub 101 format. So please share your feedback. That's how we got to this format. It's very iterative. And so um, I want to know what you think. Also, this is the first time we've tried one hour meetings and it may be a little too squished, but I really wanted to make a bite sized orientation that's doable for a lot of people. But um, that's some feedback I'll be looking for as well. Okay, now I'm going to introduce a brand new document that suspensefully is not yet linked in the syllabus, but will be after this meeting. So Mark is going to put that in the chat. And what that is, is our shared document. Um, this is a way for us to extend the one hour that we have together. So I'll give you a second to get into that document. Let me put the link. Oh, yeah, there it is. Thanks, Mark. So watch out, all of you have editing privileges in this document. It should be open and available to all of you. So we'll see how that goes. Um, I would like to talk under the Together We Create image about participation. Uh, we're a pretty large group and I'm going to run a tight ship like starting at exactly on the hour. I even got this captain's hat for the type ship that I'm going to run. Uh, when I was meeting with our Pub 101 presenters and I mentioned I was gonna run a type ship, they were like, you need to be a captain, you need to get a cap. And I took it to heart. So um, I want you to have tr trust and faith in me that I will steer us where we need to go. It's also a helpful visual cue when we need to move on to the next thing. Sometimes it's awkward to interrupt. If you guys have ever been to office hours, sometimes I don't feel great about like, coming in with a verbal karate chop. And so I'm hoping that the visual um, can also help with the transitions. So I'm always gonna start and end on time. Um, if you guys could mute your microphones um, as you already have, that'd be great. Here I have cameras off because I wasn't sure how many of our 150 were gonna be able to attend, but I think it's working okay to have cameras on. So let's try that if you are amenable. Um, we are going to do a lot of Q&A in the chat. Mark is here to manage that. And then here we are in this document for class questions and notes. You're welcome to post your questions in chat at any time. You don't have to wait until you're invited. 
Um, we are going to try and keep our discussions during this one hour on kind of big picture, conceptual ideas, um, what are we all doing here kind of stuff. So if you have a really detailed, more technical question about your specific context, for example, or how to do a very intricate thing, um, we're going to try and save that for this document. And um, that way we can focus our time together. If someone addresses a question that you would like to see um, addressed also in the chat, feel free to plus one it. Um, that could really help me and Mark sort of suss out what to prioritize if there is a flood of questions. Um, and then again, I was being really conservative about the mic and the um, video, but we can see how that comes. Zoom, as you guys know, is where we're holding this. Um, this note would have been more helpful before we all got here. Uh, but if you have any trouble with Zoom, uh, feel free to uh, let us know. So the point of this document, the collective quest questions and notes. I'm in the second half of page two here where I've highlighted. Thanks. Um, please use this document to post questions for a speaker either before or after a session. If you guys see that little um, left tab, where it's sticking out to show the document outline. I think that's really helpful, but you'll see if you if you click on that, that for each meeting, we have a before and after section for questions. So for example, um, we'll be inviting Elle and Amanda next week. I'll talk more about that shortly, but if you have questions about what you think they're gonna cover, feel free to post them ahead of time. Elle and Amanda will take a look and say, wow, a lot of people want to hear about this. I'm going to be sure to include it in my presentation. Or if we get to the end of a presentation and you're like, wow, I really have some unanswered questions, um, you can post them in the after section. How is this, how is this uh, going for you guys? Are you following? Thumbs up. Thanks, Joel. Appreciate that visual. Christina, yes. Julia, OK. Awesome. Good so far. I think it would be great when you're using the document to include your name uh, so we know where the question came from and um, try to maintain some kind of organization in the document with um, numbering questions. You're also welcome to share musings or other things. I put a section there at the end and you're also welcome to chat with one another. This does not need to be between presenters and all of you. So I can see uh, many of you have taken the bull by the horns, sorry, mixing metaphors, have taken the ship by the bow? No, that's, that's not right. Um, and started to enter your information into this table. Thank you very much. If you could please do that before our next meeting next week, um, that would be great. It's just a way for all of you to see who is here. Scrolling down after our table. Now things are slowing down a little bit for me. Okay. You'll see meeting one, October 9th. Now the reason for this perhaps odd numbering is that I'm trying to keep the meetings and the units to be symmetrical. So meeting one, we're covering unit one. Meeting two, we're covering unit two, just for your own mental organization. So meeting one, um, is going to focus on accessibility and publishing programs, so feel free to pop your questions there. So that is the gist of the shared document. I'm checking in again to see if there are any questions. I'm getting a little bit of a delay. Are you guys hearing me loud and clear or is there trouble for you? Okay. Okay, there's some delays. Some people are fine and some people are having delays. Um, I see some people shutting off their cameras. That may help for a few of us starting to get glitchy. I don't, I don't know if it's just, maybe it's the hat. I'll try removing the hat. There's probably some metal in the hat. Okay. I'm now going to start talking about how Pub 101 is a pathway into the publishing cooperative for eligible members. So there are lots and lots and lots of ways to publish a book and to build a publishing program. 
And I also expect that through Pub 101, some of this stuff may not sink in unless you're actually doing it. I think many of us have that experience as learners. Um, and so I want to offer you a continued community for after Pub 101. So the, the publishing co-op is basically a continued community of people who are working on publishing open textbooks. And we offer um, facilitation and support, much as we do in the main OTN group, for lack of a better word, um, to focus on those particular questions. So um, Mark is going to put a couple links in the chat about what the co-op is and publishing benefits and eligibility. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but I do just kind of want to connect the dots in terms of how these things fit together. So Pub 101 is now basically your pipeline, your roadway into the publishing cooperative. If you are an institutional member or a central consortial member, you are el eligible and invited to join the publishing co-op after Pub 101. And the reason that Pub 101 is the pathway into the co-op is that we want to create some shared knowledge base um, and look for a, a certain level of commitment from all of you in terms of, yes, we are going to be publishing, we're setting aside time to consider how we're going to be publishing, um, or we think we're going to in the near future. So that's the connection. Um, by joining the co-op, you get to enjoy, as I mentioned, a scribe training if you would like, a press books training, you are added to a publishing cooperative Google group. We also have what are called tea times, which are monthly drop-in calls when you can ask questions about your publishing projects. Um, we also offer you access to Scribe's editorial services. So let's say, for example, you need a proofreader or a copy editor, an illustrator, or you want someone to just take the manuscript and make it happen, um, which is a good um, model sometimes for people who get funding but don't have a lot of time and need to produce things quickly. They can be a good partner for that. Um, and so joining the publishing co-op um, gives you access to all of those things. Now, if you don't join the co-op, obviously you can still participate in Pub 101. You have access to the curriculum, the different templates and guides. You can also decide to um, request access to our Pressbook sandbox and create one free project there. Um, and you can also contact Pressbooks if you're an institutional OTN member and let them know that you um, would like their 30% discount on silver and gold plans. So the publishing cooperative is really just a broad welcoming group for anyone who wants to be involved in publishing open textbooks. In the past, um, there were different um, requirements for joining the co-op and some of those involved, for example, costs associated with producing a book in a particular way, and that's no longer the case. Um, Pub 101 is free, joining the co-op is free. Of course, if you decided to um, engage Scribe in their publishing services and proofreading services, you would incur costs per project based on that, but that's a whole other kit and caboodle. So I'll tell you more about um, next steps when we get to the end of Pub 101, but I just wanted to give this to you as a preview in case this is on your mind and you're exploring what kind of support and options are out there for you as you think about publishing open textbooks. Okay, that's the publishing co-op. We're now going to talk a little bit more about what an open textbook is, which I expect will be familiar to many, if not all of you. And um, what is included in a textbook that is not included in a monograph. So when you, how many of you, if you could just respond in the chat, because I know there's a few of you, how many of you have already taken a look at unit one? You're ahead of the schedule. You're A plus students, even though we're not grading. Amanda, mm -hmm. yes, briefly. Great, that means I can call on you guys. So for those of you who have already taken a look at unit one, what are some things that make a textbook a textbook and not a monograph? 
what do you guys remember in terms of elements and structure? Feel free to just throw it out there in the chat or you can unmute, let's try it. Michaela says pedagogical devices, yes. Let's break that down. What are some other call out boxes? Mm -hmm. Yes, case studies, review questions, tree structure, reiterating key concepts, giving summaries and objectives, call out boxes to call attention to key points, having a pedagogical intent and including those elements and devices are all parts of what make a textbook a textbook. And that's really important um, for us. And it's important because it's, it's at the heart of a lot of the um, learning that we'll, we will do in Pub 101, because a monograph is a difficult thing to publish. A textbook is a unique thing to publish. It's, it's separate from that. And so sometimes it can be a challenge, for example, to ensure that that kind of structure, that all of those elements appear as you want them to in different file formats. So for example, most of you are familiar with Pressbooks. You've seen how it can automatically create different file formats um, and make them available but you will probably notice that they are not visually rendered in the same way. There can be a lot of work involved in trying to get them to render as you want them to render depending on the file format. So um, it's typically the authors who determine consistent chapter structure. So let's say you start with a case study, as Amanda mentioned, at the beginning of, of every chapter. It would be preferable to start with it at the beginning of every chapter rather than every now and then. So it's highly recommended that authors determine a consistent chapter structure before continuing with um, developing their open textbook. And so if you begin with a case study and end with review questions, that may be your format for your textbook. This can also be accomplished in concert with a project manager or a librarian or an instructional designer in terms of really thinking about what your students need, who your students are, and how they're best going to um, process the information that you have for them in your particular subject area. It's very dependent on subject, how textbooks are structured. I know that all of you um, have seen these differences as you've been um, looking for resources, perhaps for faculty or browsing through open textbooks. So Dave has spoken to um, the publishing cooperative before about how to create textbook elements and structure with authors. You can watch that video. It's included in unit one. And so we're not going to focus on it next week. You can hear Dave talk about it. If you wanna talk more about it with each other, um, please do so in the shared document. Instead, we're going to set aside time to focus on accessibility next week. And we made this a very conscious choice to focus on accessibility in unit one at the very beginning, because it should be considered at the outset of developing an open textbook and not at the end of the process. Now, I did not give Elle fair warning that I might call on her um, during this meeting, but I'm going, I know that she's here, so I'm going to see if she's willing to say briefly um, why we're focusing on accessibility at the beginning of the process and potentially give a little preview to her presentation next week. Elle, are you willing to do that? Sure, I can jump in. Thank you. Yeah, well, just rethinking accessibility in the mindset of access, right? Thinking about it in terms of this is not something that we need to do as a to-do list or a checkbox that we have to do, oh, okay, at the end of our project, right? We really wanna think about it in our overall design and our structure. And then when we have that document all set up and we take it to somebody who's a accessibility expert, Again, you don't have to be experts at every little nuts and bolts thing. You just have to keep accessibility and access in mind that way. When you take it to somebody who's an expert in those things, it's already laid out and it saves you a lot of work on the back end 
by just doing a little bit more work on the front end. I remember reading a, a case study in UI UX journals about for every hour you think about accessibility and access in the first stages of your design thinking process, it actually saves you about 10 or 20 hours on the back end. Well, that's something to consider. Thanks, Karen. Thank you, L. That's great math. <laughs> I think we all want to save 10 hours. Um, so that's exactly right. I know that when we start learning how to do a new thing and it's a complicated new thing, we're looking for um, checklists and helpful support to help us sort of think through all of the different stages of how to do something. But we also know that oftentimes there's sort of a bigger picture, a more conceptual picture and more complexity um, to the work that we do beyond a checklist. And so I really appreciate the perspective that Elle is bringing in terms of um, putting on a, a, a director's hat, if keeping in the hat theme, um, and just thinking about, you know, what is the, the experience that I want um, the students to have? You know, what, what circumstances might they find themselves in when they are learning? Um, and how can this material reach the most number of people? Um, and so we hope to save you some time and just help you with, with a mindset um, by focusing on accessibility in the beginning. We're also going to hear from Amanda next week. And Amanda is actually going to give a preview of unit two, which focuses on developing a publishing program and two of the different key publishing types, one of which is more of a full services model. If you want to offer faculty um, editorial services support like proofreading or copy editing, and another is more of what we call a DIY model. Um, you don't have the staffing or funds for that, but you want to offer something, and so you may um, provide a publishing platform and some guides. Um, so we're gonna kind of take a look at those two options and things in between and what to consider with those. You don't need to read ahead to unit two. Um, it is unusual to have uh, two guests in one meeting. I expect it will be action-packed, and so the more you can anticipate what you may want Elle and Amanda to cover, um, they of course have their own plan, but if you want to add to the shared document with your questions, that would be appreciated. Now, before we go, I'm going to talk briefly about homework. There is kind of a special homework assignment this time around. There's Karen. the usual. Oh, yes. Sorry, can I jump in? Thank um, you, Mark. Jump in. Jonathan, Jonathan Poritz asked a question before um, we invited Al on to say, why is a uniform structure preferable? Um, I see Kathy added cognitive load, I would think, but I just wanted to, to put that on your radar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure we could have a pretty extended conversation about your question, Jonathan. It's a good one. I would say a lot of it is building expectation as a reader. If you have that mental framework or scaffolding for what to expect chapter to chapter, it can make for a more supportive um, reading experience. And it's also, I think, just um, the established consistency, if you will, within a more commercial model, which we may or may not want to emulate. Um, it is what we see um, in that space as well. So thanks for that question and the discussion. And thanks for interrupting, Mark, anytime. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's good, um, it's good. Brad, Bradley um, at University of Nebraska Lincoln also said that the video is locking up quite a bit, so it, it might be a good idea to, for a few more people to, to deactivate their video if possible. Oh, bummer. I understand. Thanks for letting us know, Bradley. Bye, guys. I'll try to remember your faces instead of these <laughs> black on black boxes. <laughs> okay. So as we um, come in the home stretch of our hour here, uh, I was um, just going to introduce the homework. So most weeks you will need to review a unit. Um, unit one, please be sure to watch the video um, that I have linked to specifically in the um, not syllabus. And then after reviewing unit one, which does include content on accessibility, I um, would like each of you to give it a go and write some alt tags. Um, you can write it on a scrap of paper, write it in your own copy of the document, it doesn't matter where. Um, the idea is just to give it a go and write alt tags for one of the three images 
and that you will find in the lab document that I've posted there. The lab document is basically um, Dave Dillon's open textbook. I copied and pasted um, the first few pages of a chapter into a Google Doc. And um, we're gonna talk about alt tags next week and also the larger context of accessibility. But I think it will be fun uh, to see you know, what that experience is like for you. Um, there's not necessarily a right answer, which is what we're gonna talk about. Um, but I will give you a very um, special clue, a hint, and that is as you're writing alt tags, consider the context. I just had a moment where I feel like Paul or Prue on the baking show before I give a baking challenge and there's like one tip you can offer. So that's my tip, that's my one tip. Um, consider the context. Um, I don't think that should take too much time and we're not gonna spend a ton of time, you know, comparing and contrasting different alt tags next week, but it is an entry point into the question of accessibility, especially as it relates to open textbooks and images. And like Elle said, we are aiming for fun. In fact, she is promising fun, like real estate. Context, context, context. So um, alt tags, you'll learn a little bit more in unit one, but again, they're really, they're a description of the image, um, imagining that the reader cannot see that image. How do you want them to hear about it and understand it? So that concludes the plan for today. We have 10 minutes remaining in case any of you have questions or concerns that you would like to cover before we adjourn. Can I just jump in, Karen, to say that Marinda McClure has included her Twitter handle in the uh, Pub 101 sort of list of uh, participants. And so if anyone else wants to do that, that would be great. Marinda's looking for people to, to chat to on Twitter and so just signaling that. Cool. Thanks, Miranda. Feel free, if you guys want to do that too, you can add it to the table that's in our shared document if you want to put it in there and then you guys um, have a lasting record. I can also share the chat transcript um, from these calls if you guys find that useful. Oh, we have a screen share. That was probably not intended. I'm going to stop screen sharing for this person. Okay, we're back. Hey Karen, it's Amanda Herford. I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, just kind of really to confirm my suspicion that if there's one session that for whatever reason you can't attend, we probably don't need to like let anybody know that we're gonna be absent, right? We just need to keep up with the readings and review the recording. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you feel really out of the loop and concerned, don't hesitate to reach out to me. But if you can't make it, um, I'm aiming to get these videos posted as soon as possible to YouTube. So like maybe by tonight, but definitely before the weekend um, so that they will be there and you'll have um, ample time to watch them so that you don't get like two sessions behind. Perfect. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Karen, will you be sharing the videos when they're uploaded in the OTN Google group or will they go somewhere else? They will, I will send you guys an email um, after I have uploaded it. So that will be kind of your cue that it's there. Um, if you missed the email, you can always check that YouTube channel that's linked from our not syllabus. Any other questions? Okay, I think that was a sufficient question pause. The thank yous are starting to come in the chat. So that means that I think we have finished our first orientation meeting. I'm really delighted that you're all here and very excited to see you all next week. And until then, uh, ahoy. I don't know what a I don't know what a seafaring farewell is. If somebody does, please feel free to share it in the chat. <laughs> okay, everybody. See you next week. Bye.